who the hell needs a cookbook for recipes? Like, if you want to make chicken tonight, you can go Google chicken recipe, and you have more chicken recipes than you'll ever make in your entire life on the first page. So I feel like for a cookbook to actually make sense in the world as an object, it needs to be something more than just a collection of recipes. You're listening to The Taste Podcast. I'm senior editor Anna Husel, and I'm here with editor-in-chief Matt Rodbard. To the end of the show, we have Francis Lamb, senior editor at cookbook publisher Clarkson Potter and host of The Splendid Table. Also on the show, we have a fun conversation with Lisa Lillian, the founder and CEO of Hungry Girl. But Anna, what did you and Francis talk about? Francis just finished working on his second ever Chrissy Teigen cookbook. It's so fun and funny. Um, he told me some stories about editing the cookbook. He told me the story of meeting Chrissy's mom. Oh, my God. Chrissy's mom is, like, really funny. You've you've interviewed her yourself. Yeah, she's great. She goes by the nickname Pepper because she loves spicy foods. So when you're talking to Francis and you're talking about this new book, like, what is a recipe that really stands out that you're like, man, this is, like, pure Chrissy Teigen? Well, first of all, I love that there's a whole chapter called Thai Mom that's kind of like about recipes that her mom likes to make. But there's also this awesome grilled cheese sandwich recipe where you take an entire package of King's Hawaiian rolls and kind of like weld them together with cheese and bacon. Dude, it's like a single grilled cheese sandwich with the entire bag of rolls. Oh, yeah. And then you get to just like pull them all apart at a party. Genius recipe. I love this. Here's Anna speaking with Francis Lamb. Welcome to the Taste Podcast, Francis. Thank you, Anna Hiesel. I want to introduce Francis with something Chrissy Teigen wrote about him in the acknowledgments of her new book. (laughs) She writes... You know more about food than any one human should, but without being an asshole about it. (laughs) It's really a special thing. I cannot wait to have a hundred more books with you. That's so sweet. Um, Did you just write that in at the end? Did she really (laughs) write that? Or did you as the editor just kind of sneak that in? You know, let's be be honest. She's really busy. She's not going to read the book. So, I, you know, I feel free to just insert all kinds of things. Easter eggs she'll find later on. It works as your resume. You can kind of show that around to people. No, no, she wrote that. I did not. I was a little bit almost moved to tears when I read it, to be honest. Um, I actually think it's... I don't know if this is where you're going with this or not, but um, I just want to say it about Chrissy. You know, she is a super famous person and she's a way more famous person now than, you know, when I first started working with her, you know, before, you know, when we were getting ready to do her first book, which like, well, it came out, what, two years ago or three years ago, which is, you know, in eternity and in Chrissy years in terms of how much more famous she's gotten. But I think... The thing that really, really strikes me about her is how, like, genuine and real a person she is. And, like, that comes through, right? That's why people love her on Instagram. That's why people love her on Twitter. Like, because she's so funny and she really, like, she's just doing her thing and she's a hilarious and super smart person, but she's, like, a really real person. You can tell a publicist is not running her Twitter. Yeah, totally. It's totally unfiltered. It's fun. Sometimes she makes fun of herself or other people at other people's expense, and it just feels really real. Yeah. I liked that so much of that voice came across in the book, and I feel like that's a testament to her having a lot of personality in her writing, but also your editing, because here's a verbatim sentence from the book. I also loves me my parm, 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 parm. (laughs) And I think a lot of editors' instincts would be to kind of like cull that back a little bit and make it um, like more presentable or manicured. (laughs) But I love that she... Grammatical, not have five words repeat in a row. Why why not? Um, I love that there is kind of... She feels as candid in the book as she does Mm. on Twitter or Instagram. That's great. I'm glad you feel that way. Is it hard to strike that balance when you're working on a cookbook between wanting it to feel really like urgent and relevant to the internet age, but also like you're creating this kind of permanent object? 
I don't really think of it in those terms. Like, I don't think of it in terms of like, oh, what's the book versus, you know, what it would sound like if it wasn't a book. Mm -hmm. um, I think every book is different, to be honest. With this, I don't, I don't feel like that's a distinction that runs through my head. Like, in general, as an editor, I feel like the most important thing for me is, does the book sound like the person? And if that person is going to say things that aren't like entirely grammatical or say things that don't like don't feel written, I kind of think that's great. And it's my instinct to say, no, let's preserve that because that's why people want it. They want you, right? Like I have another author who has this magical ability to write sentences that always sound a little bit wrong. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I can't if I sit down like I'm not a grammatic like I'm not a, I don't even know the word a grammatarian a grammarian a, a mammalian I don't know what the hell I, hell I am but I'm not that person I'm not a grammar nut I know a lot of people think like oh what an editor is is a grammar nut and like that's not how I approach it anyway and like there's some like weird reason why this person like every third sentence just sounds a little bit off but I can't tell you why and at some point I realized I don't have to tell you why, because you understand what they're saying, and that's just their voice. And actually, it's funny, because I was working with my one of my colleagues who's helping to edit one of their uh, books, and I had this conversation with them. I said, like, I think it's really important for them to sound like them, and for if that sounds a little bit off to your ears, but you don't exactly know why, that's actually kind of gold. Mm -hmm. It's weird, but it's weird because it's them, and it sounds like, again, a human being, a real person. And I think that's so important, especially in to bring it back to the internet, especially in the internet age. Because, look, who the hell needs a cookbook for recipes? Like, if you want to make chicken tonight, you can go Google chicken recipe and you have more chicken recipes than you'll ever make in your entire life on the first page, right, that okay. Google pops up. And so I feel like for a cookbook to actually make sense in the world as an object, it needs to be something more than just a collection of recipes. And in this particular case, it's got to sound like the person behind it because you care about that person. And you kind of feel like you're being actually welcomed into their home and you're kind of like sitting down to have a meal with them. Yeah, totally. Who's another author other than Chrissy who, who, whose voice do you think like really comes across in the final book? Uh, Tyler Cord. Who... Oh, for sure. He's hilarious. <laughs> I love his cookbook. <laughs> I'm like laughing just thinking about dude. Mm -hmm. uh, Tyler Cord is a chef. He has a restaurant called Number 7 here in New York City in Brooklyn, and he has a bunch of sandwich shops called Number 7 Sub, and he wrote a sandwich cookbook, which it's so funny. I probably shouldn't say this, but, like, we had originally – we, as a publisher, Clarkson Potter, had originally passed on. And the idea was not because it didn't seem great, but it was just like, who wants a sandwich cookbook? Like, right. There are a million who, out there, yeah, and usually yeah. we don't follow recipes when we make sandwiches. Yeah, you know how to make a sandwich. Yeah. yeah I'm pretty <laughs> confident. But then, like, for whatever reason, and this is actually sort of taboo in, like, the publishing agenting world, but they just sent us the proposal back anyway because, oh, there's this new guy who works there now. Maybe he'll like it. Like, that's very not done. For sure, yeah. But they, they knew you. Yeah, for some reason. Your like, it, like, you know, and it was, like, one of my – it was early in my career here. And I so I brought it to my boss and, like, well, we kind of passed on this already, but, like – I don't know, we just hired you and you got nothing else to do. So sure, why not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it ended up being absolutely one of my favorite things like in my life was working on that book because mm -hmm. Tyler Cord is like, he's so freaking funny. Absolutely. And a thing I love about that book is that the sense of humor comes across both in his writing and the recipes themselves. Like yeah. I think some of the recipes are just funny like he just decides to put strange things in sandwiches and it's kind of like inspiring and disconcerting at the same time well, i love to use that word because the title of the book is a super upsetting cookbook about sandwiches right. and it is it's like kind of upsetting like some of the things like wait why are you making a ceviche sandwich does mm -hmm. that work yes it works but it's also upsetting because he's like he's super funny but he's also funny and it's very like half that book honestly is really trenchant social commentary I forget what I think it's the zucchini parm recipe, which is like one of his signature sandwiches. It's one of his favorite things to make in the world. And as he, like I could tell 
this was totally stream of conscious when he was writing because well, he would write me the next day be like, hey, dude, I got really drunk and wrote three more recipes last night. You want to take a look at them? So like I know he wrote them drunk in the middle of the night. So he's like writing like, OK, first you like, you know, dip the zucchini in the flour. Then you dip it in the egg. Then you dip in the breadcrumbs. And he's like, can we talk for a second about how much I charge for this sandwich? And he goes in this like <laughs> six paragraph discourse about why it's like so effed that people want their food to be cheap and he's like breaking down this is why I charge for the sandwich and like okay if I charge any less for this like not only am I getting out of business but like here are all the people who work for me who like came to this country as immigrants and they're they're not going to have a job tomorrow and so like for love of God like don't come and tell me $8 is too much for a sandwich and it's actually really it's not like complainy or bittery it's just really smart really honest, really bare, and it just happens to be steps three through six of his recipe. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then in the end, he's like, great, guys, this is one of my favorite things in the world to make, and now I just totally bum myself out, and I'll never read this recipe ever again. (laughs) I like that sense of self-awareness. Are there any kind of disconcerting recipes in Chrissy's new book? Is there anything that's like totally out of left field or that feels kind of like a drunk, like late night recipe? Well, I would say that those two things uh, are not the same. True. <laughs> yeah, me. true. If anything, like, or maybe they are the same, but they're same in a good way. I mean, look, it's Chrissy. It's Chrissy's food, which is to say a lot of her food can sound like drunk uh, 3 a.m. food. One of my favorite recipes from the book, just from browsing through it, is the recipe for the grilled cheese on the King's Hawaiian rolls. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I just think it's so brilliant because those rolls are so good. They're just like the little tiny sweet rolls that you get at the grocery store. But it's it would be so hard to make individual little sandwiches. So I love that she just kind of like cuts open an entire package of them <laughs> and makes one giant grilled cheese sandwich. Yeah, that's so it, clever. It's super smart. It's it, That's the thing, right? It's like even the food in the book that seems like drunk food, there's like – there's real – cooking smarts behind it and chrissy is the first person to tell you like i'm not a chef i'm not a cooking genius by any stretch of imagination like here i am like here's an instagram of me burning my goddamn hand like trying to like make one of the recipes in the book like i am not that person Mm -hmm. but she and especially with her co-writer adina who who did her book this book and the last one cravings have this like incredible mind meld and Adina is a wonderful cook and recipe developer, and Chrissy will come with all these ideas, and they just, they just have this incredible rapport where, like, it's that thing where, like, Adina can kind of help Chrissy finish her sentences, and Chrissy can come and, like, totally know, like, oh, I have this idea, and these are three ways I think it can work, and they can, they'll just, like, make something magical. Um, and that one, it's, like, it's so dumb smart, right? It's, like, it's awesome because it's, a giant grilled cheese made out of little rolls. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But it's also, oh, but they do it in a way where they put it in the oven and there's like a baking pan under it and a baking pan on top of it and you kind of squish it down a little bit so like it kind of gets pressed and griddled a little bit so it's crispy on both sides. And then like there's a total food pour moment where you can bring it out and people pull off each individual sandwich. It's like stretchy cheese. It's like, yeah, you want it. I love that. How much of a role did Chrissy's mom play in writing the book? Because I love that both of her cookbooks have a whole chapter called Thai Mom. (laughs) And I also love that her mom's nickname is Pepper. Yeah. I mean, she loves to cook. She loves spicy food. Yeah, so uh, as you might guess from the title, Chrissy's mom is Thai. And she was definitely a huge character in the first one. I mean, like, whatever. Like, Chrissy grew up cooking with her mom. Like, that's how she got started cooking. And her mom would often make these sort of like stereotypical Americana foods in their home, but obviously as Thai. So she would make food often for herself. Like her dad wouldn't necessarily be eating some of the things, but Chrissy would spend time with her mom and like grew to love her mother's Thai cooking as well. And so like she felt it was really important to represent certainly her mother because she loves her, but also like herself in that way. Right. So in the first book, we're like, well, we have like all these different recipes from your mom. Let's like, Let's just put them in a chapter and be like, what are we going to call it? She's like, just call it Thai Mom. It's like, all right, cool. It, it says what it is. <laughs> it's exactly what it is. <laughs> and so for book two, like, Pepper had to come back. So we knew there was going to be a Thai Mom part two. And actually what was a really lovely moment was, you know, she has all these hilarious stories about her mom and growing up that, like, she, you know, she writes in the head notes of those recipes. But in book two, she really wanted her mom to take the four. 
And it was actually, that was the last chapter I got the head notes in because she's like, I'm really sorry. I know this is late, but I really want my mom to write these. Like, even if it's like, cool. yeah, you know, and so what ends up happening is she doesn't <laughs> or she writes one and Chrissy's like, oh my God, it's so hard because my mom like doesn't want to write in English, you know? So mm-hmm. like, so she has this very, like, I won't say broken English, but he has a very like, I often, you know, I have this thing where I think about um, my parents are immigrants and I have this thing about, and you know, they're totally fluent in English, but they have this thing that I like to call like the poetry of immigrant English Ooh, where, yeah. or the poetry of English as a second language where, you know, you can tell that there is like, there's like some mental leap or there's some like translation leap that happens like oh you're trying to say a thing that's probably like an idiom in the language you grew up with that totally makes sense and it i understand it in english but doesn't quite work Mm -hmm. or alternatively like your english is very plain spoken it's very direct often because like oh that's how you did like survive in this country right you you had like get the most like blunt force version of the thing you're trying to say just because you need to like communicate the barest minimum ideas right um, and in that, there's often this real beautiful poetry where, like, the word choices are just a little bit unusual or a little bit off for a native English speaker. And because you can understand the connections that still exist there and the meaning that still exists there, it's actually really beautiful if you choose to see it that way. So anyway, there's this really <laughs> immigrant English uh, head note that Chrissy's mom wrote about the crab fried rice. And it was literally like, Sometimes when daddy had money, we had crab. <laughs> All right. But there's like yeah. there's this real like honest bare spokenness to it that I think is really, really beautiful. And then unfortunately, Pepper was just like, Chrissy, I don't know. You do the rest. I won't do this. Oh. Um, but it was a really, really lovely sort of behind the scenes moment where like it, there was this conversation between mother and daughter. And um, I, I thought it was really touching. That's great. I, about a year ago, I interviewed Pepper for Taste. That's right, yeah. Um, and we had a phone conversation. And when I called into the Tegan household, uh, Pepper and Chrissy were cooking together. It was so great. I like They were just in the middle of cooking some soup for lunch and yeah. working on testing some recipes for the book. Oh, right on. It was really sweet. Yeah, and no- so I, I kept asking Pepper questions. About peppers, mostly we talked about peppers and hot sauce. Um, and occasionally she would just like call Chrissy over to help answer a question. <laughs> it was great. Yeah, they're really, really sweet together. They're really, really sweet together. And Pepper does a lot of cooking in their home. Um, I don't actually even remember why this happened, but I, w- I, w- I was like in LA for a weekend to work with Chrissy on something for the first book. And like she had to leave, and John had to leave, and so literally, like I would just like hang out in her house alone with Chrissy's mom. All right, yeah. Like for like a couple hours before I had to go to the airport, and like Pepper insisted on feeding me before I left. I was like, <gasps> oh, like I am That's some total so cool. rando in your house right now. Like you couldn't totally tell me just leave because it's uncomfortable and awkward that this rando is in my house. But like <laughs> she's like, no, 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 please. And then she, like, gave me this really beautiful rice soup. And I'm like, Are you sure you didn't hallucinate this? This is the craziest <laughs> thing I've ever heard. The, my You're angel in pepper. Chrissy Teigen and John Legend's house alone with, with Chrissy's, Chrissy's mom. mom. Yeah. This, I mean, that sounds, it's starting to sound like the start of a body short story. And that's not how it turned out at all. But um, it was very, very sweet. That's so cool. I love that. Um, I was a big fan of the Eat column in the New York Times that used to write... No, thank you. And I was wondering, I mean, so now you're hosting Splendid Table Mm -hmm. and editing cookbooks, of course. Do you miss, uh, like, writing and reporting? I know you still do some of it. But do you miss kind of like the regular routine of of going to people's homes or like a rented cafeteria in Queens and learning how things are made? Yes. Well, okay, honest moment here. This is pretty much a a pretty widely known cliche, but uh, I was first introduced to it by Ruth Reichel, who Mm -hmm. says, or said to me, she's like, you know, I fucking hate writing, but I love having written. 
And oh, I love that. That kind That's of summarizes so real. Is my feelings on it too. Um, so yeah, the actual act of writing, of sitting down and writing, and like whatever, like it's painful, it's miserable. Like I remember in college, I used to like time, like if I had a five page paper, I had to give myself five hours to do it. Like I, it would be so slow. It'd be like a page an hour, which was like so onerous. And now, you know, fast forward 20 some odd years later, quote unquote, as a professional writer, dude, if I can get anything done in five hours that involves putting words on paper, like that was a, like, that was like blazingly fast. Like everything is so incredibly slow and painful. But I love that you bring up the other side of it, which is the reporting side. And I do miss that. So that column I wrote for the New York Times Magazine was, um, so my beat was uh, to, it was a recipe column. So all the stories had to sort of funnel into a recipe in some way, which, you know, affected how it was written. But they would give me about 800 words of story that I could tell before I got to the recipe. And... Uh, the beat I had was to write about different immigrant communities in New York City. So every month I would go and spend time with someone from, you know, some like a Sri Lankan family or a, you know, an Italian American family or mm-hmm. a, you know, there are something like 160 languages spoken among students in New York City public schools. Wow! I only had two years to do this. Or only got, you know, so I only got 24 of them done, you know, I didn't like... 24 barely, is a lot, though. Barely scratch the surface of like the incredible diversity of different communities um, in the city. But it was incredible because they were most, almost entirely not chefs and restaurateurs. They were almost entirely home cooks. And to be welcomed into someone's home, you know, to have them share not just a recipe, and hey, this is how I make this and this is how I made this because my grandmother and my mother and my grandfather taught me this, you know, where I came from or whatever. But to be welcomed into a person's life for even a day or an afternoon. And the story was actually, to my mind, remarkably different month after month. It wasn't, you know, often it would be a story of, you know, the sacrifices and the challenges in my life to come here to make it here and to make a better life for myself and my family or my children. But it wasn't always that. And it was really, really fascinating to get to see. It was really fascinating and an honor, you know, to get to have people give you this gift. But I always think of it as a gift. I always think of it as like they've just opened the door to their home and in so doing and in telling me their story it's like they packed a little jewel in a box and they set it in my hand you know and it was my job to try to bring that story out into the world as clearly and honestly and true to them as possible month after month even though you know it had to end up in in a recipe and I really miss that I really miss seeing that breadth of lived experiences in the world and seeing the kind of generosity that people have that can give a stranger. It really is generous because often when, you know, a chef is interviewed by a reporter or when a reporter spends some time with a chef, it kind of operates on some level as marketing or publicity for sure, that chef, for, sure. for their career, for their restaurants. Um, but when it's happening on such a personal level, someone inviting you into their home the motives are really about sharing the story, it seems like. It's kind of like a whole different set of of motives and desires. Yeah, and even like cynically, but you don't even have to be cynically. Realistically, you could say like, oh, some people are probably motivated by like, hey, I'd love to have my name in a magazine. I'd love to have my name in the New York Times or, you know, tell my story. But there was one in particular, I remember. The woman was Burmese. She, I met her in this like really this like annual Burmese food festival that's totally like grassroots. It was just all these different people from the Burmese community here in New York City who who all make like one specialty. They bring it. There's like twenty some odd tables. You and they basically it's a fundraiser for um you know for people back in Burma. And this woman made this incredibly delicious. Um, I think it's called tohu tok. Uh, it's like tohu is similar to tofu 
in that it's a bean curd, only instead of made of soybeans, it's made with chickpeas. So it's like a chickpea tofu that she makes into this salad of with like tamarind dressing and fried shallots and fried garlic and cilantro and herbs. It's incredibly delicious. And I started talking with her and she didn't speak a whole lot of English, but like enough for us to communicate a bit. And I basically asked her like, oh, you know, can you show me how to make this? You know, I write a column, blah, blah, blah. And she goes, oh, okay. So we started like, so we couldn't find a, so I was like, oh, can I come to your home? And she didn't want me to come to her home. Mm-hmm. And sort of reading between the lines what she said to me, it's because she lived with a friend. She didn't have a place that she called her her own. She'd been in this country for a number of years, but she was, you know, sharing, like she was like living in the living room of her friend's house. And I think she didn't want to bother her friend and or, you know, didn't feel like it was a, you know, she wasn't proud of bringing a guest into a place that was not her own home. So she said, can I come to your place? I said, yeah, sure. It's a little unusual. It's not how usually this worked, but um, but she felt comfortable doing it. So I said, OK. This woman was tiny. She was like five feet tall and like 89 pounds. She brought all the ingredients, her pot, her pan, her mixing bowl, like she basically packed up her kitchen. Wow. Brought it with her an hour and 10 minutes on the train. Came to my house. We cooked this thing together. Packed it all up. And I asked her at the end, I'm like, oh, so, you know, when I write the story, it's, you know, some sort of fact-checking question. And as a journalist, you always have to tell people, I'm doing this for a story, just so, you know, they, right, they know yeah. they're not trapped, right? Or you're not, like, tricking them. And I felt like I had made that clear. But anyway, so I was like, I asked her some like fact checking question or whatever, and she was sort of confused. And finally, I realized as we were talking, like she didn't understand what I said to her that I'm writing this, I'm writing about this. And I was like, oh, she just okay. thought you were a really charming she, person. Just who some dude to learn. who came and asked her, "Can you do?" Wow. And I texted her afterwards and asked her, "Hey, you know, thank you so much for coming. It was amazing. I really want to know if you didn't know that I was writing about this, why did you come all this way?" And she just said, because I am Burmese and because I want to be nice. And wow. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> like, I'm, like, honestly in tears, like, looking at this text from this person. And just the pureness of that was so incredible to me. That is. Yeah. Wow. What else are you working on now? Are you what are you editing that you're excited about, or what are you writing that you're excited about? Well, unfortunately, I don't have a whole lot of opportunities to write right now. Um, between editing and hosting the Splendid Table, <clears throat> it's it's kind of a lot. Um, but for the show, like we're working on an episode right now, uh, all about Edna Lewis, who is a hero of mine. She was a chef and author. Um, that was another great piece uh, that you wrote for the New York Times a few oh, years you. ago. A profile of Edna Lewis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was yeah, great. Yeah. And she is amazing. She is the daughter of free... Well, she, her grandparents were enslaved. She was born in the early 1900s in this community, this sort of village that her grandparents had founded with a few other families. And she grew up in the country and uh, learned to cook there and many, many years later, wrote this book called The Taste of Country Cooking that I think sort of changed so much of America's perception of its own cuisine. Um, Actually sort of in this building, in the Penguin Random House building, because Judith Jones was her editor. Judith Jones was the editor who published Julia Child, who published James Beard, who published pretty much everyone who made American food culture in the 1960s. Yeah, she kind of defined what cookbooks existed in this country totally. for the first few generations of, of cookbooks. Totally, 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 totally. Or at least like cookbooks as like the sort of like mass market Mainstream. thing that we know now. Mm-hmm. She was like probably no single person has like changed like the face of American culinary culture uh, as much as Judith Jones. And Edna Lewis was her first... I believe this, I think this is right, was her first American author who wrote about American cuisine, or at least about a regional American cuisine. James Beard obviously did, but who like really focused on the South and focused on like her upbringing as an African-American person in central Virginia. And someone who knows 
Judith Jones' work really well, said to me, no, I believe that was her hinge point. And she kind of like told me, like, after that moment, she realized she needed to look more towards American authors writing about American food um, because Edna had sort of shown, shown her the, the promise of that. So Edna Lewis is this incredible person. I don't mean to, like, sort of center Judith Jones in the conversation about Edna Lewis, but just to say, like, one of the ways that she her legacy is, has really sort of touched the world. Um, and she's been this sort of iconic figure in American cuisine, but in particular African-American cuisine, because here's this person who cooked this really sophisticated, beautiful, seasonal, smart, delicate, but I don't want to pigeonhole her as being a, a, a delicate, she wasn't like a chefy chef kind of cook, but she just like really understood purity of flavor. And in a moment where people thought Southern food was just like fried chicken and greasy greens, she would make souffles, like as beautiful as souffles you'd find in Paris, but that she learned in central Virginia as the daughter of a woman who was the daughter of an enslaved person. You know, like that's what they made in their home. Right. And so she has this incredible um, story to tell the world and these incredible lessons to teach the world. Uh, So, yeah, we get to work on a a whole episode about her right now. Um, I have her niece on the show. Did you talk to her for your New York Times piece? Have you met yeah. her before? Yeah, 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 yeah. And her niece, who's also sort of an amazing woman in her own right, not even sort of, who, who you know, she like works in child welfare policy um, across like different state legislatures. But when she was 12 years old, she lived with her Aunt Edna and Edna Lewis famously wrote her book Everything in Longhand on yellow legal pads. And her niece, Nina, would take them and type them up for her. Wow. And so like, so we got to talk to Nina. We got to talk to um, Edna's dear friend and collaborator in like the later years of her life, Scott Peacock. And we have like really, really, really Tony Tipton Martin, who is a, a friend and a hero of mine, has a really beautiful, inspiring story about her connection to Edna Lewis, Jessica Harris. Um, this wonderful historian talks about like the context, the culinary context that Edna grew up in. So, yeah, I'm really excited about that episode. When does that come out? Uh, October 8th, I think. I'm Ooh. terrible at our schedule. I'm excited for it. Yeah. And like you... this weekend, I have a, we have a really rad episode that's sort of about like taking care. That's sort of the theme that we're thinking about. It's about self-care and taking care of others. It's like, you know, a really screwed up time right now for a lot of people it's really anxious uh politics is incredibly contentious you know our country feels like it's being ripped apart families feel like they're being ripped apart and we get to talk to cecile richards who was the president of planned parenthood for 10 years not about politics but about taking care of each other in a time when politics are so hard. Um, and Ruth Reichel's on the episode to talk about this incredible place that works with people with disabilities. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, I'm just like really psyched about these episodes we have coming up. Cool. Are there any, uh, in your book editing work, are there any topics that you're kind of looking forward to seeing? Or are there any topics that you really are hoping will be covered in the next few years of cookbooks? Yeah, I mean, I feel like I feel like something that has really sort of come to the forefront in the mainstream conversation about cookbooks, and it's really, I'm really glad that this is happening, is the need for a diversity of voices and a diversity of stories in our food media, in our cookbooks, certainly in our chefs and who gets acclaim um, in the chef world a diversity certainly of race, a diversity of cultural background, a diversity of socioeconomic background, and obviously a diversity of philosophy. And, you know, it's not a new conversation by any means. Like, you know, it's a conversation that needed to be had from the very moment we started, you know, the very moment the idea of food culture, like, appeared in anyone's head. But it seems like we're in a moment now where that's a conversation that more people are willing to have head on. And, you know, I'll be honest, like here in the cookbook publishing world, we have not traditionally and historically done a super great job of bringing 
a diversity of voices to the fore. And I am proud of my list as an editor, and I want to be more proud of it in that regard. And it's exciting to know that what I'm hearing anyway, you know, among my colleagues and my bosses is, yeah, that's a commitment that we are making. I'm so excited to find out more about all of these new authors that you're working with. And I'm really excited to dig into Chrissy's book, too. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for being on the podcast, Francis. It is a pleasure. Here's Matt with Lisa Lillian, founder of Hungry Girl. Lisa Lillian, thank you for joining the Taste Podcast. It's really great to have you here. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, it's been, I've wanted to talk to you for a long time because um, I emailed you. I was working at a PR agency as like a consultant. It was a weird job. My only time working that in that world, like, I think it was like 2005 and I emailed you once. What? You were like so nice to me. And I was like this like lowly, I was like writing press releases for the side job. And you were so nice. Thanks. I I have to find this email. I try to be responsive, (laughs) always. You were just so nice and you were a big deal and you are a big deal. And I just want to say that was a really cool thing and it stuck with me. And and over the years, I've seen your career grow and it's just, it's so nice to have you here. Well, it's good to be here. (laughs) And I'm I'm glad I was nice to you back in 2005. No, but it's it's weird when people are trying to pitch products and do that PR thing. It's a a weird, weird vibe. So you didn't have to be. But let's talk about Hungry Girl. I thought... We should start from the beginning in 2004. You, invent, you invested 10000 bucks of your own money, and you, you were, it was kind of a hope and a prayer, as, as all new businesses are. And you really made it work. What made it work? Um, what made it work, uh, I think, was the authenticity and just my genuine love of food and helping people and realizing that nobody was approaching writing about food in a way that was fun or interesting and helpful. And remember, that was before social media, before blogs, before blogging. So it was very fresh. And a lot of people didn't understand what I was doing. They were like, I don't understand. what. Who's going to listen to you? Like, who are you? And I'm like, I'm just a person who's hungry. And like, I have, I have good taste buds, and I want to share my information. <laughs> And I think that's what just caught on. It was just word of mouth. I love that. I love talking to creators from that early 2000s generation. Talked to Deb Perlman. She's a good friend of ours on the podcast. And just talking about that early days pre-social media. How were you able to grow your audience so quickly? Was it just being yourself and not being in the pocket of a big company and just doing the work? Yeah, I mean, I had worked for Nickelodeon for a while and Warner Brothers for a while. So I saw some of the mistakes I think the bigger companies were making, hiring a lot of executives top heavy, you know, putting out a lot of content without realizing who the audience was. And my goal was to do the opposite, to sort of put out a small amount of content that would appeal to the largest group and hope that people would share it with their friends. And that's why it grew quickly, because it was relevant content that really resonated with the audience, and then they wanted to share it. So that's how we grew, only mm. via word of mouth exclusively. I think what's really smart about what you do is you you write recipes and you frame a lot of your, your writing around um, eating healthier, but you never really use the word diet, right? You're not really into dieting, but you, you try to – you have clean recipes and low-calorie recipes, but also delicious recipes. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, I, I tried to steer clear of – I mean, with the exception of we did have a Hungry Girl diet. Diet, yeah. which was after like 11 books or something, I figured, <laughs> oh, it's time to right? have a diet plan. But I try to make Hungry Girl an umbrella brand that embraces however and wherever people are eating. It just helps people make smarter choices no matter what mm-hmm. food plan you follow. So tell me, what is the Hungry Girl ethic and ethos? What what drives you? What, 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 do you, what excites you about home cooking? Well, um, it's, you know... Big portion, small calorie counts. Mm -hmm. That's sort of what I always strive for. And it's about making things easy and accessible. You know, I I was a person that grew up never really um, cooking. I liked food assembly. I'm a mad scientist. I like replicating flavors and tastes, but I'm not chef-y in any way. So I just wanted to make smart choices, smart eating, and recipes accessible to the masses. So what is a key to get us there? Like, what is something to keep in mind when you're cooking, when you want to keep the calorie count low, but you want to have these delicious flavors and really have, like, a full meal at, like, the 350-calorie range? 
Well, volume eating is a big part of it. And so these days, and even before it was a huge fad, I use a lot of produce in place of starchy carbs because I'm a person that would like eat bread and pasta all day if I could. Like in another world, in another life, I think I'd like to be that person. So instead, I use a lot of cauliflower and a lot of zucchini and a lot of spaghetti squash, and that adds a lot of volume. And I've always um, been a person who wanted to seek that out. Even before that was trendy, I was using broccoli slaw. Yeah. which was something that I originally was feeding to my bunnies. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, if you just take this and throw it in a skillet, you can make this taste like pasta. Now there's a million things that taste oh, like pasta. Oh, for sure. And cauliflower rice, we cover it a lot on taste. It's the, the whole like fad. But it, you were doing it really early. Like you were doing cauliflower rice like a decade ago, right? Yeah, a long time ago. And cauliflower, I've been saying it for a while, but cauliflower yeah. is the new black. <laughs> it's great. And I just think about like I walk through the produce aisle and I'm like looking at the heads of cauliflower and I'm like, you had no idea how popular you were going to become. It was like, a vegetable that nobody wanted to look at, think about, smell forever. And now it's just like, it's it was, everything. It was like the oft-neglected um, produce in the crudite platter. I felt like broccoli and carrots always go first and you had your cauliflower there. I know. But then... It's terrible and sad. Fast forward to now, 2018, and man, cauliflower prices are higher because of the demand for cauliflower rice. I know, it's crazy. So give me your best cauliflower rice recipe just off the dome right now oh my gosh you could just throw it at, i mean to make the fried the easy fried rice is the best i mean just even with a little soy sauce and a little bit of like scrambled egg and the the pre-made like the peas and carrots the frozen veggies i love to throw shrimp in there mm -hmm. it's just it's too easy everything just takes a couple of minutes it's and... legit i mean when you when you're talking about like a, a skillet meal when you're just like throwing some frozen vegetables and throw some cauliflower rice and some eggs that's like a really satisfying meal and i think the food Food media always poo-poo's it because it's not cool or whatever, but whatever. I am I don't care about that in any way. <laughs> like my life are skillet meals, truly. Like yeah. I when I'm personally cooking, if I'm not grilling, like I love to grill, sure. but um, skillet meals are just so easy. And I use my, my new favorite product that I found is palmini. Have you tried that? Oh, yeah. It's so good. It's the hearts of palm. Yeah. It comes in a can. I heard they're moving it to a pouch, possibly. Wow. I don't know. But it's really good. And it really tastes like pasta. And it couldn't be easier to use. So. Palmini. Okay. Palmini was a shark a Shark Tank product. I mean, it sounds smart. It seems like these alt meats, like jackfruit, is really blowing up too right now. I've seen a lot of jackfruit like on the counter for these meat substitutes, these hearty vegetables that can serve as a sub. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I've tr I've yet to try jackfruit that I love. Do you like it yet? <laughs> no. I mean, it's true. I, I haven't. I've only had it a few times. And some of the packaging is cool, and I'll buy it, and I'll taste it, and it's not. And I'm like, oh, I don't uh... love it yet. But it's funny. I My niece who lives with with me right now um, is vegan. So I'm trying to be open-minded about a lot of the, the products that I find that are meat substitutes. Um, so there are a lot of great ones out there. Tell us about the magazine. You launched your own magazine, which I think is probably a dream for anyone in food is like you do your, your cookbook and your blog, but then you kind of graduate to like doing your own magazine. You do it with uh, with with which publisher? I'm sorry. I oh, Meredith. With Meredith. And you mm -hmm. love it. So tell me what's in these magazines. I'm, I'm super interested. Love it. I mean, the magazines are beautiful. Like yeah. I can't even get over how beautiful they make these photos and the paper and it's just it is definitely recipe centric but there's a lot of um, things that are a little bit more niche that I don't really get to do in books like in some of the issues there's like rainbow foods and the world's cutest foods so it's just I don't know I wanted to take it and have a different approach to what Hungry Girl has done so well and I, I think the magazine is just a lot of fun and there's even information about um, my dog Lolly who I love is always in there and there's um, so pet you food you finds. are the editor in chief, and you're like the 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 voice behind the magazine. How does that work editorially? Do you go into the office once a month to close the issue? How does that work? Well, we run Hungryland out of um, Woodland Hills, California, yeah. and everything happens there. So every bit of content that's created for the brand happens there, including the magazine. The magazine, the photos are shot over at Meredith. But as far as the editorial, every recipe is developed in our kitchens and all the writing happens mm -hmm. um, in L.A. for everything. The daily emails, the magazine, the books. So everything is consistent. I, What's I cooking like... at Hungry Land? What is it? Does it smell really good all the time? Yes, it absolutely does. <laughs> it's like Disneyland. Yeah. It's, so much, it's like Love a it. really fun place. There's probably like 10 or 11 of us that work there. Yeah. And it's bright and colorful. And the kitchens are just always booming. And they do – it's much All there. from this $10,000 investment in 20, 2004. 
Yeah. This all. I, mean, I mean, I worked out of my house for a while. Yeah. And I remember my husband would come home from work and I'd be sitting in my sweatpants surrounded by what he called tasteless wafers. <laughs> Because I would be reviewing products yeah. before the recipes, and he's like, I don't know what you're doing, but if you can find a way to make money doing this, you're yeah. a genius. And, and he was so right. He he was right. He usually is right. <laughs> Do you hang with the other food personalities like Pioneer Woman and Ina? Do you get to hang out with any of them? No, I wish. I, I, I want to meet Ina. I've never met her. When I did have a show on Food Network for yeah, a I know couple you did. seasons, yeah. and that was fun. So I did get to meet some of them, yeah. but it's not like we're all like hanging out, like going skirt shopping together <laughs> or anything. <laughs> or just cooking, maybe. We can... Yeah, exactly. No, we're not doing <laughs> Maybe that. we should do that for taste, get, get a bunch of you guys together and do a story. All right, I'm in. I think that would be fun. Sign me up. You live in LA, which I think is a cool food city. What, what do you, do you go out to dinner a bit in LA? Do you... All the time. Okay, I figured, because, like, come on, why wouldn't you? I love going out to dinner, and I'm obsessed with sushi. Oh, my, do you live in Woodland Hills, too, is that? I live in the Calabasas area. Oh, cool. So, San Fernando Valley, but I think L.A. has the best sushi in the world. It's... Hands down. Like, better than Japan, in my Mm -hmm, opinion. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I I love the sushi in L.A., so there's a lot of really good sushi, and my favorite sushi chef is named Kazu, and he has a place in Studio City. Um, little known. So if you like sushi and you're What's up the there, place? Kazu Sushi. Kazu Sushi. Mm-hmm. It's an City. old strip mall. Like That's everything. the best. Studio City has got some great spots for sure. Great, great spots. But yeah. I even like the, I mean, I love Dantana's. Okay. It's one of my favorite restaurants. I don't know if you've been there. Uh, I haven't had the pleasure, but we're you working on a lasagna there. book for taste coming out in next September. And we've like funneled the Dant- Dantana's like vibe into our book. Oh, that's good. The food there, I mean, it's Great. You can't go wrong there. And believe it or not, one of my favorite restaurants is a vegan restaurant called Crossroads. Have you been there? I have not, but it's on my list. I've tried to go the last few times I've been in L.A. I just haven't. I, I'm a huge fan of the cookbook, though. The you cookbook's need to, beautiful. Yeah, you need to go. You need to try it because it's unbelievably yeah. not vegan tasting. So I don't know how they do it. Tal Ronan's a magician. Tal Ronan, yeah. He's, 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 he's the gem. But you grew up in Brooklyn, right? You, you're five year, your first five years? First five years. Good what are pizza. Your, yeah, good pizza. <laughs> what do you remember about Brooklyn, old school? Um, old school Brooklyn. I remember the toy store I shopped at. I remember yeah. the rice pudding my mom used to buy for me at Appy's Deli. I don't even. Know. I can't even believe I pulled that name. I out love of it. My I don't know. Head. Maybe we'll have a reader right in. <laughs> and good, really good pizza. Yeah, you know, I went to Long Island. I just my all of my really early memories are about food. Shocking. I mean, not shocking. It's it's what you it's your ethic. Uh, last question. We ask all of our guests this question on the Taste Podcast. If you could write your dream cookbook, you've already had 13, you said, so you've written many, but what is your dream cookbook project? Like, no budget, no, like, it could be anything. What would you want to do a whole book on? Oh, wow. That's tough because I do. I'm on my 13th book. I so, know. like, I think I probably have done it, but it would just have the most beautiful photography in the world because it had taken me such a long time to be able to have photos of every single recipe in my books and only the last three have had that. So it would be probably a coffee table book with Mm. like the most beautiful photography ever. Do you have like a favorite style in mind? Is it like like dramatic, like still lifes or is it like making of the food? I th- Well, more of the making of the food yeah. because we don't really get into that, but vibrant, really rich, yeah. fun and lo- very colorful. Lisa Lillian, thank you for joining the Taste Podcast. Thank you. The Taste Podcast is hosted by Matt Rodbard and me, Anna Heasel. The show is produced by Gabrielle Lewis, studio recordings by Pat Stango, theme music by Steve Rydell. Interviews are recorded live at Books Are Magic in Cobble Hill, Brooklyn and at Penguin Random House Studios in Manhattan. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com. Thanks for listening.